Hi, I'm retired NYPD Detective Vic Ferrari, and welcome to NYPD Through the Looking Glass podcast, where you'll get unique insight into the New York City Police Department. Before we get started, I encourage you to check out my Amazon author page, where you'll find my series of behind-the-scenes NYPD books. They're $10 paperback or $2.99 ebook download, including my latest and bestseller, NYPD Laughing in the Line of Duty, which is filled with a lot of funny and interesting police stories. I was supposed to have a really good guest today. Unfortunately, he had to cancel last minute, so I'm kind of going to give you a hodgepodge of stories. But let's get to the news from the New York Post, because that always makes for some interesting stories. Two NYPD sergeants get into shoving match after one of them made a snarky comment about a quirk in the union contract that lets new sergeants make much more money than their senior counterparts. The officers, well, you know what, I'm not going to read their names because it's kind of embarrassing. But both of Central Park Precinct got into the scrum about 7.40 a.m., too early to get into a fist fight, on Monday after one made a, cl- made, made a few cutting comments about the difference in pay between senior sergeants and newly promoted sergeants, according to a report in the New York Post. Okay, so first of all, the Central Park Precinct is cake. <laughs> There's a police station in Central Park. And basically, you got a couple of guys that drive around, do uh, patrol. The rest is scooters or foot posts. It's a cake detail. I've never heard of someone being, I mean, it could have happened, but I've never heard of an NYPD member being punished and sent to Central Park. I mean, you know, if you're a ball of fire and making a lot of arrests, yeah, I guess that would be considered a punishment. But Central Park Precinct is, is a nice place to work. And, I mean, it's getting childlike where you get two sergeants, right? So these guys got to have probably at least four, five, maybe six years on the job, and they're fighting over who makes more money. Sounds like a couple of kids in, in a sandbox. Kind of embarrassing if you ask me. Now, this story is funny. New Jersey deputy mayor resigns after calling Pine Barren residents inbred and imbeciles. She called them country bumpkins, so they gave her something to pine about. The mayor of a South Jersey town has resigned over a social media post in which she slammed the so-called pineys, folks from the state's rural Pine Barrens region, as mentally deficient inbred imbeciles, according to officials. Natalie Stone, who held a position in Tabernacle, sparked outrage in a, when in 2020 Facebook post she made this comment. So I'm guessing this was made years ago when it's come back to bite her in the ass. Um, if any of you Soprano fans out there... The Pine Barren scene where uh, Paulie Walnuts and Christopher, they go to drop that Russian that was in the trunk of the car that they thought they killed, and they bring him out to the remote area of the Pine Barrens, which that's not where they filmed it. They actually filmed it up in um, Orange County, New York. But anyway, the Pine Barrens, apparently they have people there, you know, they have um, constituents there, and this this deputy mayor, I mean, calls her constituents imbeciles. I, I don't get it. But, uh, yeah, so the Pine Barrens is where they filmed that scene in The Sopranos, and then you never know what happened to the Russian. Daredevil street racer who taunted cops in New York City and New Jersey is busted after he's linked to his Instagram account. An obnoxious street racing influencer, influencer, give me a break, was finally arrested after he filmed a series of videos taunting cops in high-speed stunts with expensive cars across the New York City and New Jersey area. Queens Daredevil... Antonio Genesenstri, I don't know, 19, was nabbed last week if cops linked him to the popular Squeeze ben, Squeeze.Ben's account on Instagram and Twitter. You know, it's one thing to get away with a crime. Nowadays, these kids, they're posting it, and it's coming back to bite them in the ass. I mean, why would you do something? I guess they're doing it for the attention. Well, he got the attention he didn't want, and now, now he got arrested. It's funny with these kids with these straight street racing teams. We locked up a kid one time out in Brooklyn. Um, it's a funny story. It's just a quick story. But um, one of the guys in our office got contacted by some company out in the Midwest um, that dealt in, um, it was like a, an eBay Motors. It wasn't eBay Motors, but it was something like that where auto parts are shipped and, 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 and transferred across the country like a swap shop. Well, a BMW motor was shipped from Brooklyn, and it was stolen. And now this company was out the money. So they contacted this detective in my office. He got a search warrant. We went out to Brooklyn. I mean, we were in the Bronx team, but we wind up in Brooklyn on this. It's out by Coney Island somewhere. And um, 
beautiful house, nice house. And in the back, there was a garage. So he gets the warrant for the back garage. We hit the place. And, you know, it's a nice family. And their son, they, they built this garage for him out in the back. And, I mean, it was you could eat off the floor. And what the kid was doing was he was a BMW enthusiast. He was stealing them. And he was chopping the parts. And then he was shipping them all over the country. But the wild thing was, the kid was such a BMW enthusiast. I'll never forget this. He had the M3 emblem. So BMW's, their racing performance uh, car is, is the M's, the M3, the M5. This kid had the M emblem tattooed on his calf. So we kind of they took a photo of that and used it against him. And then the father wanted to kick the crap out of the kid because he didn't realize his son was running a chop shop in the back of his house. Anyway, back to the news. An 18-year-old driver of the reckless crew who doused an unsuspecting NYPD traffic enforcement agent, that's a meter made the guys that write the tickets, with the fire extinguisher and a twisted prank has been arrested, police said. Armoire Alashishi was arrested behind the wheel of a gray sedan with three passengers when the car slowed down at St. Nicholas Avenue, 118th Street, as it approached an unmarked NYPD cruiser just before 7 p.m. So what these guys saw the, um, the video on YouTube, what these clowns are doing is they're driving around with a fire extinguisher and they're pulling up to people and they're, they're asking them for directions or getting the driver's attention and then they just spray the fire extinguisher into the person's face and fill up their car and they drive away laughing. And like the last moron, they're posting it on social media and they got arrested. Now, I am not a fan of traffic enforcement agents. I've gotten many a ticket from them, but that's wrong. You shouldn't do something like that. You could have got the guy killed. Could guy could maybe lose an eye or if he's allergic to it. It's not right. It's just like I said, it's the erosion of society. Here's another one with our migrants. Two groups of brawling migrants, illegal aliens, ganged up on a pair of NYPD officers who arrived to break up a fight in the Roosevelt Hotel on West 45th Street, battering cops and biting one, law enforcement officials said. Both cops were taken to the hospital with minor injuries. The four migrants, illegal aliens, were arrested, three of whom were free after prior arrests. So here we go again. You got the Roosevelt Hotel, which I'm... I'm guessing is an SRO now. They're using it to house these illegal aliens. And these people are just basically brawling with themselves. They've got nothing to do. And they're getting arrested and they're getting let back out. And then when the cops get called to kind of control the situation, they turn on them. And they know that nothing's going to happen to them. So it's just sad. Here's another one. A dirt bike rider rammed into an NYPD cop who tried to boot him and two other cyclists at a central park last week. The officer was riding a marked scooter and attempted to escort three riders out of West Drive and West 90th Street area just after 4 p.m. That's when one of the motors turned aggressive and struck the cop on his bike. You see these videos now all the time where you got these guys on quads, trikes, dirt bikes, motorcycles, mopeds, unicycles, you name it. They're just going out in packs and driving on the sidewalk and terrorizing people. And I guess now they're going into Central Park. When I was in the auto crime division, we would grab these kids every now and then and take their bikes. And a lot of them, the thing is, especially with dirt bikes and quads and trikes, they're stolen a lot of times, but they're never registered because they don't have, they're, they're not meant, meant for the street. So there's no license plates on them. So we would recover these things. And they were often stolen from, like, Pennsylvania and New Jersey decades ago. You, you, we would find one that was stolen 10, 15 years ago, like, out of the Poconos. And here it is riding around on the sidewalk during the Puerto Rican Day Parade in Spanish Harlem. So, yeah, they got to do something. I've seen videos where the NYPD is confiscating them. And then they're bringing them out to the pound, and then they're driving a bulldozer over them, which is good. I mean, because you don't want to auction them off, because guess what? When you auction them off, they get them back, and they're doing the same thing. So it's good that they're crushing these things. Whistleblowing ex-NYPD sergeant jailed for six months on minor assault charge being housed next to a cop killer. Former NYPD sergeant Sergeant Lee, who helped expose a karaoke bar corruption scandal in Queens in a precinct a decade ago, was found guilty on two counts of a misdemeanor assault on May 14th for an off-duty brawl at a Chelsea club in 2021. A judge sentenced him to six months in the infamous jail where he's being housed next to a cop killer and a drug dealer who beheaded a man. So this is a bizarre story because th there's, there's definitely more to this. You got a guy that, uh, uh, listen, I'm not excusing him assaulting anybody. 
But for him to get six months in jail for it for a misdemeanor three, I mean, come on. There's something definitely more to this story. I'm kind of guessing he pissed people off with this um, karaoke bar corruption scandal. Maybe it hit somebody too close to home. It just, it just something's not right here for this kid to get sentenced to six months in jail. But who knows? I mean, I don't know the whole story. New York City Police Department fired an officer after he was discovered allegedly spying for the Chinese Communist Party, according to internal disciplinary records. NYPD Sergeant Stephen Lee, different spelling than the last guy, this is L.I., who worked at the Department's of Fraternal Affairs Bureau, had helped a Chinese national contact a Chinese woman between 2019 and 2021, investigators say. And that's scary if, if the Chinese Communist Party has infiltrated the New York City Police Department because the amount of information they could gain and the amount of things they can do is just, it's scary. So I'm glad they caught this guy if he did it, but that's uh, it's a scary story when you have foreign governments infiltrating our law enforcement agencies. So like I said, I had a guest cancel, so I'm kind of giving you a hodgepodge of things. But we're going to talk a little bit about corruption. And I'll tell a police corruption story. But corruption, so when you go into the New York City Police Department, from the day you get hired, they tell you you're going to get fired. They give you these fiery sermons from these district attorneys tasked to prosecuting police corruption. They explain that getting a free cup of coffee or a discounted meal is going to lead to bigger and better things. Um, If you screw around, you're going to go to jail. They show us videos and they bring in ex-cops that have been fired and served jail time to tell their story, how they got involved in drugs or financial issues and they went wrong. And I mean, you need not but just pick up the paper and you just see the things going on in New York City. So if the NYPD does one thing really well, it's they warn you right up front. If you screw around, you're going to get fired and you're going to get you're going to get prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. But. Sometimes corruption goes on higher than the New York City Police Department, and we get to see it. So this is uh, late 80s. I'm a rookie cop. Uh, I get assigned to a South Bronx precinct. And as the new guy, I mean, you're doing all the crappy jobs. You're getting the shitty assignments. You're guarding hospitalized prisoners. So I was doing a midnight shift, and I was assigned to be the assistant desk officer. So when you're an assistant desk officer, you're basically at his beck and call. Uh, Go get me a cup of coffee. um, Go answer the phones while this guy is on his meal hour. And you're the goalie. You're making sure anybody walking into the station house, A, isn't there to do anybody harm, and B, doesn't get to the desk officer before you interview him and make sure whatever problem they have, you can't address it before it gets to the desk officer. So I'm doing a midnight, and these two cops that had about a year more than me and I really liked them. They were really good guys. And a lot of the old timers wouldn't talk to you. But these guys, they, they even though they had a couple of years more than me, they were always nice. They would drive me out to my foot post or can we get you something to eat? They're just nice guys. They come in with a stolen vehicle arrest and a couple of bodies. And they come up to the desk and they're filling out the paperwork. And one of the female prisoners is insistent she's got to use the phone. They said, okay, just they fill out her pedigree information. And um, they put her in a cell. They search, They have female cop come. They search them. I got to use the phone. I got to use the phone. I got to use the phone. Okay. They let her make a phone call. Probably about 25 minutes after that phone call. Now, this is on a midnight. So the phone really doesn't ring that much, especially the desk phone. No one has that phone number. Next thing you know, the desk officer is under siege. That phone is just ringing off the hook. And he's got a pen out. And he's writing down names. And um, he's getting calls from one police plaza. He's getting calls from the borough about these arrests. So we can't figure out what's going on. And every couple of minutes he gets off the phone and then he goes up to the two cops processing the arrest and he's asking them a ton of questions and they're kind of scratching their heads and they're giving them the best answers they can. And like I said, it was a stolen vehicle. I think it was an overdue rental, but it was definitely the car was reported stolen and there was a small amount of drugs in the car. So the next thing you know, the duty captain shows up. Now a duty captain... You get when you, Once you get promoted to captain, they're not going to give you a command to run right off the bat. So what they do is a lot of times, and especially if you don't know anybody, you go straight to the borough. And at the borough, basically, you're the duty captain. And 
every shift, the duty captain drives around the borough and responds to things. He's the eyes and ears of one police plaza. So if there's a, a, a police shooting or a homicide or a missing child, the duty captain gets involved. He basically is running the show and he's keeping one police plaza informed of what's going on. Like I said, the NYPD is like a McDonald's franchise. One police plaza is Hamburger U. Then the boroughs, the boroughs are like the district office. And then each precinct is like the McDonald's franchise. So what happens is the duty captain shows up. First off, he goes to the desk officer and he pulls him into a room and now they're talking and he comes out and the next thing you know, he's bringing in the two cops that made the arrest and they're going back and forth. And these cops were young, but I remember like the hair on the necks were up, like they were pissed off. What wound up happening was one of the passengers of that car, her mother was a local politician. And the daughter called the mother and the mother called her friends and the friends called the powers that be at the New York City Police Department would set off all these bells and whistles. So ultimately what wound up happening was, through this woman's influence, the duty captain told the two cops to void the arrest. Basically telling them, void the arrest, you know, you you didn't have probable cause. Whatever he told them, they voided the arrest. And I remember they were upset, but they were new too, and they weren't looking to make any waves, so they caved. And they did what they were told. And this duty captain told my friend, because he told me, he said, the guy told him before he left, you make sure, what did he say? Um, Make sure you know who you arrest next time, officer. Like, so like, what kind of message does that send? So like I said, corruption, you know, it's not, people think of police corruption, but sometimes it's a lot higher. But what comes around goes around. This uh, politician, uh, probably about 10 years later, she got snagged in a bribery scandal, so she got arrested, and she wound up getting, I, she was sentenced, I think, to 90 days in jail, and I think she received five years probation, if memory serves me correctly. So what comes around goes around. I'm sure it was anyone else. It would have been five years in jail, but she got 90 days in jail and five years probation. So that's the first time I saw corruption inside the New York City Police Department, but then I saw it even closer to home, probably a year or two, no, about two years after that. So I'm in field training, and there's a guy in my field training, and I liked him, and we would work together on foot post every now and then, and we had a good rapport, and after field training, we went our separate ways, and then a couple of years later, we wind up in the same unit, and, you know, this familiarity with us was still kind of the new guys, so we decided to partner up. And I liked the guy. I worked with him for about six months. But his life was a mess. So he was married to one woman. He knocked up another girl. He was trying to get get out of a divorce with his wife and set the new girl up in an apartment on the sneak. It was it was always something. He was a nice guy, but his life was just a personal mess. And he, I didn't pry, but he shared these stories with me. So one day, we're working together, and... Um, he tells me, he asks me, he goes, um, now this is like late 80s, early 90s. He goes, um, I got to ask you a favor. I said, well, what's up? He says, can I borrow five grand? I said, five grand? No, no, five grand was a lot of money back then. Five grand's a lot of money now, right? So I said, well, what for? And I'm thinking it's something to do with putting, you know, his, his, this kid that's on the way in the apartment. He goes, I'm thinking of getting a Corvette. I said, are you kidding me? I said, you got to take care of, you know, this woman and the kid. He goes, yeah, but I, I, I saw this vet. The price is right. I said, listen, I can't help you. I don't got five grand. Okay, no problem. So we're working together another couple of months. And uh, then he comes to me again and he says, listen, he says, I'm transferring out of here. My childhood friend is going to this precinct. I want to I want to work with him. Nothing personal, but I, I want to get out of here and work with, with my childhood friend. I said, all right, you know, whatever. And he leaves. So I would see him and this new partner of his, nice, seemed like a nice guy, always making arrests. Always, always, always. Guys, these two were like big overtime earners, always making arrests. So, you know, I, I wish them well. And um, what no one knew was, was this guy that I worked with had gotten himself so far over his head financially with creditors, and I think, he might have knocked up another girl, and again, it was a mess. He had a cousin 
or a relative that was a drug dealer that no one knew about. So to make extra money, instead of driving a cab or getting a job as a security guard, this guy, what he's doing is he's transporting large amounts of narcotics for his cousin. So he, get, he gets picked up on a, a DEA wiretap. I think it went federal. And they ripped him. So what they did was during on a midnight shift, he's moving drugs from a safe house from one place to another. The DEA grabs him. He's got a stolen gun on him and a lot of cash, and he's got weight on him, a couple of kilos. So they lock him up. They're going to take him federal. And he says, whoa, 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 whoa. He goes, um, I, got poli- you know, I know about police corruption in my precinct. So the feds, um, they call the Internal Affairs Division. They show up like that. And he's going on and on and on about all this police corruption in his precinct. So they make a deal with him. They're going to use him. They're going to use him because he's going to cooperate. So they devise a plan because he got arrested, I think, on a, on a weekend. What they did was they send him back to work his precinct Monday, but they put him in a cast. And they put a Kel. A, uh, a, a, it was either a, a recording device or a device that transmitted to a recording device. And they said, okay, you're going to be our eyes and ears in the precinct. Strike up a conversation with your coworkers about um, corruption. And, you know, we're going to record it. And if it's what you say it is, we'll, we'll make a deal with you. He said, all right. Well, the problem was there wasn't police corruption in his precinct. He was the bad guy, but he had sold them a bag, uh, bag of goods. So he's going up to guys and he's striking up conversation with guys trying to lead them into conversations about things. And they're like, what are you talking about? You know, and long story short, he wore this wire for six or eight months. And the only person he was able to hang was his old partner. So what he would do with his old partner is he would, he would bring it. Remember when this happened? Remember when that would happen? And his partner apparently admitted to some things that they did together, which no one knew about. And they wound up locking up his partner for perjury. I think what it was is they had made a couple of gun arrests and they lied or they said that, or he said he lied that, um, he said something like, remember the time you said we found the gun in the guy's waist, but it was actually under the seat. And his partner said, I, I guess so or whatever. But long story short, they indicted the partner on perjury. Now, if he did it, he did it. If he didn't, he didn't. So when that story broke, it shook everybody. It's like, wow. And, and then people start coming up to me. Didn't you work with that guy a couple of years ago? Because th- this is several years after I had worked with him. I said, yeah, I did. But I mean, I, I didn't know he was a dirtbag. I knew he had financial issues, but that was about the gist of it. So another couple of years go by, and um, I'm in the court, I'm in the Bronx courthouse. I'm testifying. I think it was on an insurance fraud case or something. But I'm in the courthouse, and I'm waiting outside the courtroom to be called in to testify. And I'm just kind of pacing the hallways. And and the Bronx Supreme Court, it's it's a decadent old building, and you had back then you had pay phones. It seemed like every Hundred yards, it was a payphone, I guess, back in the day for reporters or whatever. So I'm just kind of pacing the hallway, waiting to get called in by the district attorney. And who do I see sitting in a phone booth but my old pawn? And he had changed his appearance. Like, I did like, not a double take, but like a triple tape. So he had shaved his head so he was bald so he wouldn't be recognized. And he lost a ton of weight because he was a thick guy. And he probably was thinner than me. And I just looked at him. And I said, how you doing? He said, fine. And I said, what happened to you? And he goes, you really don't want to know. And he shut the door to the phone booth. And I was like, okay. I mean, nothing more to say here. So that was the last time I saw the guy. And I think his partner was acquitted on all the criminal charges. But the NYPD fired him for a host of departmental charges. So the partner partner wound up losing his job. My old partner wound up losing his job. I don't think he did any jail time, which I think he should if he's moving around. Wait, another corruption story that never made sense to me. No one ever really got to the bottom of it. And I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'll just tell you what I know. There was a homicide or a double homicide in a um, Washington Heights precinct. And everybody shows up. Duty caption shows up. The detective shows up. Homicide shows up. Crime scene shows up. Everybody shows up. So they process the vehicle and everything, and the bodies go to the morgue and everything. And a couple of days later, the family of one of the victim or victims shows up at the police station and says, um, you know, there was a lot of money in the trunk of that car that belonged 
to our family or belong to the victim. And it was a lot of money. I think it was well over $100,000. And uh, that sets off bells and whistles, right? Because now the Internal Affairs Division is like, what the hell is this? So now they're all over it. One of the detectives involved in the case comes forward a couple of days after the allegation and says, yes, there was money in the trunk and myself and two other members of the New York City Police Department took it. And he says, I think it was the patrol sergeant of the precinct and the other guy worked in crime scene. So now the story doesn't make any sense because if three guys are going to steal that much money, you would think they all know each other. you got three guys working in three separate places that might just know each other from a nod, or I've seen that guy around. So that, that didn't make sense. And what the guy did was he came forward with a third of the money. And he said, the other guys have the other two-thirds. So internal affairs immediately, as soon as they hear this, they get search warrants. They hit these other two cops' houses, and they find nothing. <laughs> they're going through their bank accounts. They're climbing through their attic. And this is literally days after the allegation. They didn't find anything. So the cop that came forward, allegedly his old man was a big wig in IEB or had worked in IEB. And the story behind it was he panicked and tried to get some of the dirt off himself. He threw these two other guys. He concocted this story and tried to get the other guys in trouble. But what wound up happening is he got transferred to our precinct. And, uh, you know, everybody was like, here's a guy that's admitting that he, that he took money. He didn't get fired. He gets two other guys in trouble who ultimately they didn't get in trouble, but I'm sure they got modified and they got pulled through the ringer. The guy kept his job. So that was one of the more head scratch. I'm sure there was more to that story, but supposedly they only came up with a third of the money that he said that he took. I don't know. Maybe the other guys did or they didn't, but, um, you know, it was a wild story and no one really ever got to the bottom of it. So anyway, again, I apologize for such a thrown together show. I was supposed to have a really good guest and hopefully I can get him back next week. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in, especially my friends in Cape May, New Jersey, Clearfield, Utah, St. Petersburg, Florida, Pawtucket, Connecticut, 29 Palms, California. My brother was a Marine out there. Summers Point, New Jersey, and Fort Smith, Arkansas. If you work in law enforcement or have an interesting criminal background and would like to be a guest on the show, please drop me a note on Twitter or Instagram. If you're listening to the show or watching the show on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and hit the like button. I need my subscribers if I'm going to make any money doing this. If you enjoy the content, check out my Amazon author page and type in my name, Vic. Ferrari Like the Call, where you can preview all my books for free, including my latest and greatest NYPD Law and Disorder. Thank everyone again for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next week. Take care.